Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, we're talking about The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. As part of my preparation for this book, I did a ton of research on Victorian England, and that ended up spinning off, becoming its own little mini video series. I will have that playlist linked because it's super helpful contextual information um, that really informs uh, a reader's understanding of this novel and what we're going to be talking about today as well. I'm switching up my format to um, begin with an introductory video that is meant to be sort of like a primer for getting started in reading this book. Um, it's completely spoiler free. It should be helpful for you as you're getting started. And of course, if you have already read the book, then this is still a great place to start. So before you read The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, watch this. Here's our outline for today's video. First, we're gonna have some biographical information about Anne Bronte. Second, I'm gonna give an overall of the review of the novel's premise. I'm not gonna give away anything about the plot, but I'm gonna give you an idea of what the premise of the novel is. We're gonna review the structure of the novel, and then finally, we're gonna take a look at some core concepts that I think are really important for you to pay attention to as you're reading. All right, so Anne Bronte. The Bronte family is super interesting, and Anne Bronte is probably the least recognized of the family um, of the three sisters, and ironically, many forget the one brother. I mean, they actually did have Branwell Bronte. Charlotte, of course, is most famous for Jane Eyre and Emily for Wuthering Heights. All of the girls wrote under male pseudonyms in order to be published. I read from the Oxford Press copy. Let me see, do I have it here? So this is the version that I read from. It's the Oxford Press copy, and it has a really great um, essay in the front, which is part of the introduction, which I'm gonna be using uh, for reference for much of the information that I got today. So I read from this um, Oxford Press copy, and it had a great inf introduction that detailed how our perception of Anne is really colored by the um, biography that Elizabeth Gaskell wrote about Charlotte Bronte. And Charlotte Bronte is the one who's really defining for us what Anne is like because it's drawn from her like diaries and letters and that sort of thing. So Charlotte's own interpretation of her sister is really this dominant voice that we've had with us throughout all of history. And this traditional view of Anne is that she's quiet, long-suffering, meek, mild-mannered, um, the most pious in a religious family. And while it's clear that she was quieter than the rest of her sisters, her writing certainly shows that she's no wallflower. She displays a very strong moral viewpoint and tackles subject matter with this novel that is more controversial than those approached by her sisters. At the time of its publication in 1848, the tenant, uh, was met with re wildly negative reviews because the naval not naval because the novel takes an honest look at domestic abuse alcoholism adultery the victorian audience really considered it shocking vulgar coarse while at the same time they recognized that there was ultimately a christian moral viewpoint undergirding all that was happening in the novel Perhaps above all, the novel explores the sense of powerlessness that the main female character has in her situation, and it's profoundly candid. Um, and I think, for me at least, I think it's that's really what's core to its continued influence in society today. The introduction also connects the subject matter of the novel with Anne's close experience with her own brother's affair. So apparently Branwell Bronte had an affair with the married Mrs. Robinson in whose home he was a tutor. Um, Anne was also employed as a governess there at the same time, so there's some sense that she was aware that this illicit affair was happening at the time. When Branwell was found out and eventually discovered as having an affair with a wife, he was dismissed, obviously quite a disgrace. And later on, when Mr. Robinson died, he renewed his overtures to Mrs. Robinson, but she apparently was not interested. And 
he, Branwell suffered an early death as a result of alcoholism and addiction to opium. Um, he was generally depressed even after he was like rejected and moved out uh, and discovered because obviously that would have been very disgraceful and embarrassing. He couldn't get work after that because his reputation was ruined and he really fell into a deep depression even further after he was rejected by the now widowed Mrs. Robinson. While I generally advocate keeping a clear distinction between the narrator's voice and the author's personal life, it's not really fair and we don't really know to what extent what happens in their personal life informs what they write about. It's pretty clear that this experience would have informed what she, the subject matter that she tackles in The Tenet of Wildfell Hall. While again, I don't think that it's supposed to be a biographical, the fact that she has experience with infidelity and addiction, what, and those topics are being explored here, I think that's clear that there's a connection there. So let's talk a little bit about the premise of the novel. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall tells the story of Gilbert Markham and Helen Graham. Helen is the new tenant of the long abandoned and decrepit hall in Market Markham's neighborhood. She is beautiful and apparently widowed with a young son. Gilbert quickly falls in love with her, but she's very reticent to encourage him in any way, encourage any romance. She's like, we can be friends, I enjoy your company, I enjoy your conversation, but we can't be more than friends. As we explored in episode four of the historical context of the Victorian England series, the Victorian novel often used the structure of a basic romance to explore many other issues, and this novel definitely conforms with that pattern as well. The structure of the story is also really interesting to me. The first portion is told from Gilbert's perspective, and the conceit that's used is that he's writing letters apparently to his very close friend, um, and he's basically divulging the story of how he and his wife ended up getting together. Um, and this person is apparently the husband now of his sister. This type of conceit is often portrayed in early novels where they're sort of like coming up with an excuse for why the story is being told. And I think it's important to remember that the form of the novel is really quite new. Um, one candidate for the earliest novel is Pamela by Samuel Richardson, which is written in the form of a diary, and it's kind of a similar format as a letter writing novel, right? And that was published in 1740. Prior to that, stories were presented in plays or in verse, in epic poetry, that sort of thing. The novel didn't really exist. Um, as a sidebar, you should also check out Shamala by Henry Fielding, hilarious satire on uh, Pamela. Anyway, uh, it's almost like authors are sort of like looking for an excuse for writing in this new form and they felt the need to kind of like justify the existence of the story. So Tenet is published about a hundred years later, but given the whole history of storytelling, this is still a relatively new form. And as we talked about in our Victorian England series, the novel is really hitting its heyday here um, and coming into its form. So Gilbert's perspective is relayed in a series of letters. The conceit is that he's sending portions of his story along, um, which is indicated in the first three chapters, but it drops off after that and you just end up getting this story. Again, I think this is really just to help readers of this new form sort of accept the story and get into it. It's sort of like easing the suspension of disbelief that is required when you dive into a story, whether it be in movie form or in the novel form. Likewise, Helen's portion of the story is sort of embedded within the letters, but they're her diary entries from her past. Um, her narrative tells of her experiences as a young bride before she came to Wildfell. We have a sort of like nested narrative then. So we have like Gilbert's letters, Mar Mr. Markham's letters presented as the present wrapped around his narrative of the past. So that's sort of like the second shell inside of there. And then embedded within that narrative is the more distant past, the diary entries from Helen before she came to Wildfell. Um, and then we step back out each step by step as the novel comes to a close. This form of a novel is called an epistolary. It's from the Greek word epistle, which means a letter, not a letter of the alphabet, but a letter that you send to somebody in the mail. 
and both letters and diary entries, you know, dear diary, are considered an epistolary form. Um, and this form is very similar to a first person narrative. So you get an in depth view, close view of the narrator, everything from their perspective. You become intimately acquainted with their perspectives, what they think, and what happens to them but it's also really limited. You don't know anything that they don't know. You don't see any experiences outside of what they themselves experience. And this, of course, can be a tool that an author uses well to sort of like sustain a mystery. For example, in the first par portion where we're getting blah, blah, blah. For example, in the first portion where we're getting Gilbert's experiences um, exclusively from his first person vantage point, we really have kind of like this mystery of, well, who is this woman? Who is Helen? Where did she come from? What's her story? And so since he doesn't know, the author is using that skillfully to hold back that information and to extend out that mystery until the right moment. But the form is also restrictive, so it's very much set in the present tense. In Pamela, for example, there's a sense that the story's kind of trying to like burst free from this form. You get the sense that Pamela is sort of experiencing something and then scurrying over to her diary and writing down, oh, and then this happened, you know? Um, and that is a little bit awkward. Anne Bronte, however, gets around both of these problems, which is the constraint of the first person narrative and the constraint of time by having two different perspectives through the epistles. We get Markham's perspective, we get Helen's perspective, and we also get some of the more interesting features of narration, which is Markham reflecting on his own past and kind of giving insight and thinking about why he did what he did. Thoughtful refre reflections are also carried through Helen's diary as she writes about her daily life. The diary is also interestingly constructed in some portions um, are really only yearly entries on the anniversary of her first marriage. Um, and this may moves the reader like quickly through the years while also tying it to that very essential moment and concept in the novel, which and it sort of like reinforces this marital commentary 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 that's happening throughout one of the things that really struck me while I was researching Victorian England was how few of the major concepts of the Victorian era at first blush seem to be present in this novel so until I thought about it more closely, I guess. So much of what defined Victorian England and a lot of what we talked about in that video series is what happened in the city. Urbanization, industrialization, factories, workers' rights, the development of the middle class, women, female suffrage, all of these things that are happening around human industry and our response to that in the culture of a city. And yet, as with many of the Bronte novels, this is set out in the country. And so there's a sense of distance from many of those troubles that are happening in the large cities of England. But that doesn't mean that these commentaries and these social questions aren't coming to bear in this novel. It's just, they're happening a little bit differently. So with all of that said, let's take a look at the core concepts um, and see how they interplay with what we've already learned about Victorian England as well. So the first concept that we want to talk about is marriage. So I indicated this earlier, obviously marriage is a big part of this question. We're dealing with issues of adultery. We're dealing with issues of what makes a good marriage. We have this marriage plot is this overarching thing of will they eventually end up together? We don't know. You have to read to find out. I'm not going to spoil it for you. Um, so as you have probably intuited so far, it's a super important concept. Not only do we have older generations giving various pieces of advice to the young people, we have a whole range of different couples that are presented in this tableau and we can see good marriages and bad marriages and ways in which they succeed and fail um, for each and how each person sort of affects the couple as a whole and what they bring to the marriage. And as we talked about, the marriage plot or the romance forms the structure of this novel which allows the narrator to explore many other concepts. Particularly intertwined with this question of marriage and coupling is class. Perhaps more than anything else, marriage becomes the vehicle for class mobility. Uh, this novel, like Wives and Daughters, advocates a marriage based on coherent values and worldview, not based on similar class and wealth. 
So the social mobility is part of the his historical context as well. The rise of the middle class in wealth and power, the union of interest between the working class and the middle class begin to erase these differences and create a culture of social mobility. At the same time, the increased wealth that the middle class is acquiring is creating a union between the middle class and the upper class, again creating a sense of social mobility between these previously pretty strictly enforced lines. Another concept, feminism. This book, goodness, one-two punch, makes some really, really strong arguments for the um, value of women. Through circumstances and speeches given by the various characters, the emancipation of women is clearly advocated by this novel. Through this story, we see how female characters suffer through their lack of power and autonomy. Pay attention to how the social societal structure prevents characters from being able to freely act. This too is clearly a Victorian concern with the rise of female suffrage, and this novel does not shy away from talking about it. Thirdly, wait, fourthly, addiction. So we also get an honest view of alcoholism. We see a character and those around them suffer as a result of an addiction to alcohol. The novel reveals their decline of body and mind. Um, and considering Victoria, Queen Victoria's own prim and proper morality, the idea of indulging in vices like this is really at the top of mind. But Anne explores them here with honesty and rawness that the audience probably was not prepared for. Um, in this way, the work really exemplifies some of the extreme self-consciousness that we also talked about in our historical context series. And finally, religion. This novel presents a thoroughly Christian worldview and examination of the characters and their marriage through, can be understand through this moral can be understood through this moral framework. Their joys and sufferings are in proportion to their virtues and vices. And to the way that the virtues and vices of those around them affect them. So you can either be a blessing or a curse to the person that you're married to or you're friends with. This too is a worldview that is being closely examined in this time. We have the proliferation of evangelicals. We have serious doubts coming from the realm of scientific inquiry, especially with Darwinism. And we have Anne's own doubts in her own faith, um, which we'll explore more in another video. And that's all I have for today's episode. And in my next, uh, episode, we're going to discuss religion and vices, two of the topics that I mentioned here. And if you want to support my channel um, so I can continue to produce literary analyses like these, consider becoming a subscriber on Patreon. As always, liking and subscribing here on YouTube is a huge help. Uh, you can find my Patreon link down below as, long, uh, as well as all of my other social media links. You can find me at a lovely jaunt everywhere. And until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.